Thank you for standing by. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Amazon.com Q3 2020 Financial Results Teleconference. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Today's call is being recorded. For opening remarks, I will be turning the call over to the Head of Investor Relations, Dave Files. Please go ahead. Hello, and welcome to our Q3 2020 Financial Results Conference Call. Joining us today to answer your questions is Brian Olsowski, our CFO. As you listen to today's conference call, we encourage you to have our press release in front of you, which includes our financial results, as well as metrics and commentary on the quarter. Please note, unless otherwise stated, all comparisons in this call will be against our results for the comparable period of 2019. Our comments and responses to your questions reflect management's views as of today, October 29, 2020 only, and will include forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially. Additional information about factors that could potentially impact our financial results is included in today's press release and our filings with the SEC, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and subsequent filings. During this call, we may discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. In our press release, slides accompanying this webcast, and our filings with the SEC, each of which is posted on our IR website, you will find additional disclosures regarding these non-GAAP measures including reconciliations of these measures with comparable gap measures. Our guidance incorporates the order trends that we've seen to date and what we believe today to be appropriate assumptions. Our results are inherently unpredictable and may be materially affected by many factors, including fluctuations in foreign exchange rates, changes in global economic conditions and customer spending, world events, the rate of growth of the internet, online commerce and cloud services, and the various factors detailed in our filings with the SEC. This guidance also reflects our estimates to date regarding the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our operations, including those discussed in our filings with the SEC, and is highly dependent on numerous factors that we may not be able to predict or control, including the duration and scope of the pandemic, including any recurrence, actions taken by governments, businesses, and individuals in response to the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, on global and regional economies and economic activity, workforce staffing and productivity, and our significant and continued spending on employee safety measures, our ability to continue operations in affected areas, and consumer demand and spending patterns, as well as the effects on suppliers, creditors, and third-party sellers, all of which are uncertain. Our guidance also assumes, among other things, that we don't conclude any additional business acquisitions, investments, restructurings, or legal settlements. It's not possible to accurately predict demand for our goods and services, and therefore, our actual results could differ materially from our guidance. And now, I'll turn the call over to Brian. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start by extending a big thank you to all the folks who worked hard to make this year's Prime Day a great success, not only for our more than 150 million Prime members around the world, but also for the hundreds of thousands of small and medium-sized businesses who sell on our Amazon store many of whom are facing their own challenges during this pandemic. These businesses thrived on Prime Day, with third-party sellers recognizing more than $3.5 billion in sales over the two-day global event. That's a 60% increase compared to Prime Day last year. I also want to thank and recognize the contributions of the more than 1 million Amazon employees and delivery partners who are continuing to work hard to serve our customers all around the world. We will continue to spend what it takes to help ensure the safety and well-being of our employees and partners. Now let me share some highlights from the quarter. Our Q3 results largely reflect a continuation of demand trends we saw when we exited the second quarter, with strong demand and sales growth across our major product categories globally, including hard lines, consumables, soft lines, and media. We also continue to see strong prime member engagement Prime members continue to shop with greater frequency and across more categories than before the pandemic began. They continue to expand their usage of Prime's digital benefits, including Prime Video. Internationally, the number of Prime members who stream Prime Video grew by more than 80% year-over-year in the third quarter, and international customers more than doubled the hours of content they watched on Prime Video compared to last year. We're also reaching more customers with our grocery offerings, 
In Q3, our year-over-year growth rate of online grocery sales continued to accelerate, and we've continued to offer more convenient options for customers, including grocery pickup, which is now available from all Whole Foods market stores. And just as we saw in Q2, Prime member renewal rates improved in Q3 year over year. 3P sellers, who, as I mentioned, are largely comprised of small and medium sized businesses, continue to be an important part of our offering to customers. Our 3P seller services revenue continued to grow faster than online stores revenue. With particularly strong growth this quarter in FBA, as we return to a similar mix of FBA as a percentage of total 3P units as we had seen prior to COVID. 3P units continue to represent over half of overall unit volume, increasing to 54% of the total unit mix in Q3. We're investing heavily to support sellers and are pleased to report that over half a million sellers are seeing record sales in our stores this year. We continue to focus on stepped up employee safety, particularly in our fulfillment and logistics operations, to help ensure the safety and well being of our employees and partners as well as the employees and customers shopping in our Whole Foods market and other stores. This, of course, has added incremental costs to our P&L. The largest portion of these costs relate to continued productivity headwinds in our facilities, including process revisions to allow for social distancing and incremental costs to ramp up new facilities and the large influx of new employees hired to support strong customer demand. This also includes investments in PPE for employees and enhanced cleaning of our facilities. In total, we have incurred more than $7.5 billion in incremental COVID-related costs in the first three quarters of 2020, and we expect to incur approximately $4 billion in Q4. Our consolidated revenue and operating income exceeded the top end of our guidance range. As demand remains strong in the quarter, the extra volume and operating leverage helped us to achieve higher than expected profitability. And we saw another strong quarter of revenue growth in operating income performance in AWS and advertising. We had good leverage with our fulfillment centers, as well as in Amazon Logistics, our transportation network, despite the higher COVID-related costs that I mentioned. Although we had strong growth in our network in Q3, some of our fulfillment network expansion shifted out a few weeks and will happen in Q4 rather than Q3. Once new buildings open, they are short-term headwind to profitability as they ramp up and we prepare for Q4 peak. More of this headwind will be felt in Q4 rather than in Q3, and this is reflected in our Q4 guidance. We were able to meet the heightened demand in Q3 because we opened up more network capacity, particularly in our transportation network. I point to two important drivers of this. First, we hired a lot more people to support the strong customer demand. We welcomed 250,000 permanent full-time and part-time employees just in Q3, and have already added about 100,000 more in the first month of Q4. I will note that these are permanent jobs with industry-leading pay, including Amazon's $15 minimum wage, and great benefits such as health insurance, 401k plan, and parental leave. Secondly, this has been a big year for capital investments. We've invested nearly $30 billion in CapEx and finance leases through the first nine months of 2020, including over $12 billion in Q3. As I mentioned last quarter, we expect to grow our fulfillment and logistics network square footage by approximately 50% this year, which includes significant additions to our fulfillment centers, as well as our transportation facilities. Majority of these buildings open in late Q3 and into Q4. About half of this square footage growth will be on the transportation side through the opening of more sort centers and delivery stations. And finally, in AWS, customer usage remains strong we continue to see companies meaningfully growing their plans to move to AWS. And we are busy gearing up for our annual reInvent conference. This year, reInvent will be a free three-week virtual conference running from November 30th through December 18th. We are extremely grateful to our employees across Amazon who have delivered on unprecedented demand for several months now, as well as a strong prime day in October. We are ready to go and looking forward to meeting the needs of our customers this holiday season. With that, let's move on to Q&A. At this time, we will now open the call up for questions. We ask each caller, please limit yourself to one question. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your keypad. We ask that when you pose your question, you pick up your handsets to provide optimum sound quality. 
Once again, to initiate a question, please press star then 1 on your touchtone telephone at this time. Please hold while we poll for questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Thanks for taking my question. I have, I have two, Brian. Just the the first one. You know, you mentioned the fulfillment center saw good leverage in the in the quarter. Can you just talk to us about some of the some of the qualitative drivers of this improvement you're seeing in fulfillment cost per fulfilled unit in the quarter and sort of year to date, and how to think about the durability of that uh, over time. And then secondly, I think throughout the summer, Amazon Logistics launched the third-party delivery service in the UK. I'm curious just to hear about sort of early learnings from that product and how you think about scaling that to uh, other countries and maybe globally. Thanks. Sure, Brian. Uh, thanks for your question. So, um, yeah, the fulfillment center uh, cost is going to be a blend of um, the COVID-related part of the COVID-related costs that I've uh, mentioned and, and uh, itemized. Um, Offset by some really strong leverage, I would say that um, you know we've been running uh, very consistently high levels, uh, really since uh, all of our employees were came back in the uh, first or second week of May, and it's because uh, so, some of them had been on uh, unpaid leave. The uh, uh, so that demand is very consistent and strong, and uh, has created uh, a lot of favorable. Um, Leverage because again, uh, the order pattern being high and consistent is leveraging our fixed cost assets. Um, things like our delivery routes are more dense uh, at high volumes, so we see even in transportation some uh, increased efficiencies. Offsetting that again is productivity elements that we've articulated. Things like social distancing, extended breaks, uh, other other steps we're taking to keep people uh, safe and distanced uh, in our in our facilities and our delivery network. Hey, and this is Dave. I, I don't have much to share, I think, on the, uh, what we've got going on with uh, uh, any, any of those AMZL efforts other than i just say, you know, we're always working to develop uh, new and innovative ways to support um, the companies we work with, including small and medium-sized businesses who sell on Amazon. And, and that includes testing you know, shipping programs that can help any of these businesses get packages to customers quickly and reliably. Great. Thank you both. Our next question comes from Doug Enmuth with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, Brian, just wanted to go back to the 4Q uh, operating income guide. Um, appreciate uh, your, your thoughts there. Just trying to dig a, a little bit deeper in terms of how you're thinking about it, um, kind of beyond the $4 billion in, in COVID costs. It still feels like uh, maybe there's some more in there that we're not uh, thinking about perhaps beyond the square footage increases and in, in the incremental headcount. Um, so if you have any comments there, and, and just curious, um, I know it's early on, on 2021, but you've obviously uh, done a ton of investment this year um, and with the 50% square footage increase, um, and you tend to cycle at times in terms of uh, CapEx investment. Just how do you think about digesting that, um, that kind of build out as, as you go forward? Thanks. Sure, Doug. Um, one last comment I forgot to mention to Brian on his last question is um, the fact that uh, a lot of that heightened demand uh, so far coming Q2 and Q3 when we tend to have excess capacity before Q4. So that's another source of leverage, especially in non-peak uh, quarters. Uh, as far as guidance is concerned, again, I think the um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, certainly uh, in Q4. We generally have a lot of uncertainty around the holiday, uh, thing from holiday spending to uh, what our cost to fulfill normal orders would be, weather issues that can come up. This year is an election year. We saw some disruption in 2016. So there's a whole host of issues that generally are, uh, you know, come to bear in Q4. I think the fact that COVID um, uh, is dwarfing all of those is causing us a lot of uncertainty on our top line range. Um, we do see continuation. We saw continuation in Q3 of some really good trends from Q2, um, and we've uh, pr projected those into Q4. Uh, some of the negative factors that you mentioned as far as profitability is, is again, 
the uh, we'll, we'll see more of the brunt of the uh, capital investment and the people investment. Um, we we had hand, added a lot of people in the last quarter, and then we added another hundred thousand people in October so far. So there's that. There's um, generally um, you know the uh, dynamics of Prime Day uh, because it's a deal oriented time period. Um, that's uh, usually not the uh, highest margin period, and that is shifted into Q4. But uh, generally, you know, we have really, because of the calendar this year, we have really uh, built our capacity, included both in facil facilities and people, and are carrying it through the entire quarter. You know, we we carried it through uh, uh, Prime Day, and now we're carrying it through into uh, the rest of the quarter. Uh, I think in other quarters you might have seen a more gradual build up that would have occurred through October and been probably maximized in November and December. So um, uh, that is the uh, uh, that's what I would tell you on on holiday. Again, we have our normal caveats that there's a lot of uh, you know uncertainty and things that uh, could go uh, right and wrong. So that's why we put a, a range around it. And I'm sorry, could you repeat your second question? Just on um, how you, how you think uh, about. 2021, perhaps, and just CapEx build out going forward, um, given that you've uh, really stepped up the investment uh, in 2020? Sure. Uh, well, I think some of the investment, things like grocery delivery and that capacity, um, it are things that we would have uh, invested in over time, and um, they're being matched by higher order volume. So uh, our intent is to con continue to deliver uh, a, a great grocery uh, delivery experience for our customers. Um, so that that is a little bit of a pull forward. Yes, on we we did uh, expect to build out our uh, logistics capacity a lot this year, especially as we had been, um, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, as we had been rolling out one day delivery, the middle of last year. That was setting us up for a build, a uh, big build this year. Um, so we pulled forward a bit from uh, 2021 uh, into this year to satisfy the demand. Uh, I think we have a uh, the logistics team is really good at um, you know in one way locking up long term commitments on space and buildings, but on the other hand being able to uh, um, adjust the timeline in or out to match uh, capacity and demand. I think at this point we are uh, not trying to cut it close, and we are you know uh, erring on the side of having too much demand or too, excuse me too much capacity. Um, and uh, we think that's the right call. It has been this year. And, uh, you know, we'll just, as we get through the holiday, we'll learn a lot more. Uh, hopefully the pandemic will uh, will be in better shape as a, a country and a uh, globe uh, in Q1 of next year. But uh, it's very reactionary at this point. We've got we've to gotta, uh, play the hand that we're dealt. And, um, you know, we're trying to anticipate uh, and, and keep the customer insulated from, you know, any variability. But um, it's challenging, certainly. Thanks for the caller, Brian. Our next question comes from Justin Post with Merrill Lynch. Please proceed with your question. Great, thanks. Um, when you when you look at two, 3Q, the environment, can you help us kind of understand uh, the best you can quantify um, how much of the the incremental unit sales do you think are are being aided by COVID, or how much is it just a natural recurring uh, shift online that could recur and, and, and continue to grow next year? Any thoughts on that? And then same same type of question for the cloud. Um, with you know, there's I'm guessing there's some headwinds of lower transaction volumes for some of your customers, and then maybe there's more demand from the work at home environment. So if you could give us any any thoughts on on both retail and cloud and and how COVID's in, impacting it and and could there be um, how that will impact next year? Thank you. Sure. Um, it's it's hard to predict. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, there's been phases of this year. Uh, last year, excuse me, um, early on there were a lot of stock-ups of groceries and other household supplies, followed by a wave of people buying gloves and um, disinfectant wipes and uh, masks and you know, that uh, may be a, a bit of a, a bubble that uh, people are not uh, going to buy as much next year. Hopefully, that would be a good problem uh, to have if those demand, that demand went down. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we're seeing uh, prime member engagement. So it's, you know, it's, it's strengthening our prime program. We're adding uh, the renewal rates are going up uh, and the engagement's going up. And so people are 
buying more frequently and across more categories. They're using more of our digital benefits. So they're, we like the trends on uh, kind of connectiveness to our prime program, and we think that will have lasting value. You know, when, when uh, things open up a bit more um, and there's more uh, store options for people to buy from, uh, you know, there, there will be a, a you know, leveling of uh, volume back to the stores, I would imagine. But uh, so, so we think the trends are uh, good. They've been pulled forward probably a bit from our uh, – the adoption curves have been pulled forward from our uh, you know, pre-COVID uh, thinking, especially on things like grocery delivery. Um, so uh, your second question on the cloud, you know, cloud's a mixed bag right now because, I mean, we're very happy with the cloud performance, um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of customers who are now moving to the uh, cloud at a faster pace. They've accelerated their plans. Um, there's you know, anomalies in different industries going on this year. Things like ho tra uh, travel and hospitality are down. Um, a lot of companies are in a holding pattern in the middle, and some are doing really well. Things like video conferencing and gaming and remote learning and things tied to entertainment. So uh, I would say the majority of the uh, companies, though, are looking for ways to cut down on expenses. Um, I mean, going to the cloud is a good way to cut down on expenses long term. They're trying to cut down on their short term uh, costs in the cloud by uh, you know, tuning their workloads and we're helping them do that uh, and doing the best we can to help them uh, save short term dollars and, and again tune their, their usage against some of our benchmarks. So we think that is uh, uh, good for the customer and that for, therefore it would be good for us long term. But even uh, you know, despite uh, those actions, we had strong growth. The, year-over-year -year, uh, growth in absolute dollars this quarter were the largest we've ever seen. Um, and we, you know, we feel good about the state of the business and the uh, state of our sales force and their ability to drive value during this period. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, you know, companies extending their uh, contracts with us. The backlog of you know, multi-year deals has gone up uh, quite a bit. So um, you know, it's good uh, from a um, you know, customer connected connectiveness standpoint. Uh, certainly, each industry is going through different dynamics right now. And you can see this, Dave, as well. I just add to that. You can see a, a number of those significant new commitments from customers called out in the release. So, carrier, global payments, a number of others. There's also you know also seeing some um, you know good uh, engagement with governments. Um, they're recognizing like, the need to transform tech get their technology more nimble and innovative. Schools and universities are, are planning for online learning. So um, a lot of help uh, we can work with customers to provide there. And on the kind of from a product perspective, we're, we're seeing significant momentum with um, our AWS Design Graviton 2 processors. So you've got customers like SmugMug and Netflix and there's many others, but they're, they're realizing up to 40% better price performance from the, the newer, uh, newer uh, Amazon EC2's, the MRC, T instance families. So when you compare that to the x86 based instances, and those Amazon EC2 instance families are all powered by our, our new AWS Design Graviton 2 processor. So really pleased with what we're seeing uh, there in that engagement as well. Our next question is from Heath Terry from Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Great, thanks. Um, just a couple of things want to uh, kind of related. Uh, how should we think about where capacity utilization of the fulfillment infrastructure is at this point with the, the wave of growth that we've seen and the, the wave of new warehouse announcements? Um, you know, what kind of CapEx is going to be necessary to sort of bring you back to what you would consider normal levels that, you're, uh, that you'd be growing from? And then, you know, there's obviously been a lot of discussion around the capacity li limitations that third-party uh, shipping networks are going to see this holiday season, um, given given demand. How much of an issue do you see that as being? Um, and given your investments and your own delivery capacity, does that become a competitive advantage for you during the holiday? Yeah, thanks, Heath. I'll start with that last one. Yes, um, and they are a bit all intertwined here. So. The th uh, third-party shipping, we rely on third-party shippers. Um, we have great partnerships around the globe with third-party shippers, and um, uh, we know that their capacity will be tight, as will ours. 
we do feel good that we've invested quite a bit in our own uh, capacity, and you uh, just mentioned that about half of our ops uh, capex is going to expanding transportation. A lot of the people that we're hiring are, you know, uh, also focused on transportation. So. We feel good that we've been able to develop that uh, capability a lot this year because we've needed it, and we're going to need it in Q4. Having said that, it's going to be tight for everyone, and I think it's um, uh, you know we'll all be stretched, and it's advantageous to the customer and probably to the companies for people to order early this year. But uh, regardless of the order pattern, we're going to do our best to uh, give the usual excellent service uh, to our customers. Um, on capex levels, again, we've we've uh, uh, grown. Our infrastructure, excuse me, our um, fulfillment and logistics infrastructure, 50% this year. Uh, we'll see again what that implies for next year. Um, we do we do see continued uh, expansion and uh, uh, capex, specifically in uh, our transportation area. So that will be the start of uh, probably a, a you know, multi-year period where we're ex ex uh, uh, higher on capex for that. Uh, but we'll see. We're, you know, right now we're just focused on Q4 and, and giving the guidance for Q4. Your question on capacity utilization, um, you know, it's been very tight this year. Uh, as certainly, uh, we were able to fill up a lot of our any excess capacity in Q2 and Q3 that might have seasonally been uh, excess. Uh, as we get into Q4 and everything's stepping up, um, you know, we're adding it and using it simultaneously. We had a really good test for Prime Day. And uh, uh, you know we feel good about the performance of the network, and we continue to add on top of that. So, uh, lots of excitement um, around the holiday, and uh, you know, but we we feel we're we're in good shape and ready to go. Our next question is from Mark Mahaney with RBC. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Two questions, please. Um, uh, how should we think about these uh, four billion expenses in the fourth quarter, the seven billion uh, year to date? Like, do you view them more as one time ish, or just um, overall increases as you built out the network? Are, are they are they structural or one or one time ish? I really want to get at that. Secondly, uh, international uh, segments been nicely profitable, or you know, reasonably profitable for two quarters in a row. Is there some reason to think that that's sustainable? Um, and then, I'm sorry, a third question: the other revenue growth accelerated to 49 percent. Can you give any color behind that? Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, Mark. Thank you. Um, let me start with the COVID question. So um, we have uh, again. Uh, our, our expenses in Q3 were estimated to be 2.5, around 2.5 billion, and uh, we're seeing uh, closer to four in Q4. Uh, the majority of that is due to the uh, expansion of our um, operations. So things like uh, productivity that, uh, you know, there's pre productivity drags for things like uh, new higher ramps, social distancing, extending break periods. Um, Things that we can quantify that said, look, this is this is a change in our process that has that has hurt pro, uh, productivity. We also have costs related to uh, that are uh, more. Those are so those are calculated a bit. There's more direct costs around uh, cleaning and supplies, testing, and um, uh, those are the main things I would say. So uh, what we're trying to do by capturing these costs is to uh, show what is we believe is incremental. Um, and the intent is that these, for our own knowledge as well, that these will, uh, you know, once once uh, the pandemic is over, uh, and hopefully that soon, that these should be costs that don't recur. Okay. Um, we know, though, simultaneously, there's some benefits going on right now. There's things like, you know, uh, in Q2 we had uh, lower marketing expense. You see that in our trends. Uh, it's starting to come back in Q3 and Q4 to more normalized levels, but certainly everyone, you know, there was, there was not a lot of requirement to, or need to do marketing um, this year uh, for parts of the year. Uh, we've saved, you know, uh, nearly a billion dollars in travel this year because, um, you yeah, know, travel's ground to a halt, uh, internal travel, travel and expenses. So there's things like that that will uh, resume at a later date and maybe not get to the same levels as the past, but they will be, you know, they won't be as artificially low as this year. So, you know, we're trying to be um, transparent as best we can on the cost we're seeing. Uh, we're not always netting against some of the favorabilities from demand, 
uh, uh, and some of the other costs that might be you know, offsetting, although they're not offsetting to the extent that the COVID costs are sitting there. Um, and then, I, you know, I will point to the fact that we are, because we're running at such a high level um, and a consistently high level, uh, really in off-peak periods, uh, we have been able to run these warehouses very efficiently. Efficiently, you have to split the discussion kind of between the cost penalty on the COVID-related issues, but then there's certainly been some uh, favorability from you know, running assets at uh, you know more full-out condition. Okay, so uh, hopefully that gives you some color on it. Um, international uh, segment profitability. Yeah, I would say, and I think we discussed this a bit last quarter. Um, you know, we're we're seeing an advancement of volume, and very strong volume, if you will, in especially in our countries in Europe and Japan. Uh, that uh, you know, so we, so we may be putting in a way, you know, future volume onto this year's cost structure. So that is probably why you're starting to see. Or that is why you're seeing profitability in international. I would say generally we are still. Um, investing ahead of the U.S. in a lot of dimensions internationally, things like prime benefits, uh, things like um, the uh, devices, um, things like international expansion. You might, see this, you might have seen that we just launched in Sweden yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of competing factors going on right now internationally, um, but I think right because of the high volumes and the leverage we're seeing, particularly in places like the U.K. and Germany that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's creating uh, profitability ahead of schedule, if you will. Um, but we feel good about the level of investment. Uh, that's continued, and uh, we see that, uh, you know, we're committed to continuing that uh, even after the pandemic, uh, and, and including the international segment, of course, is India, where, um, you know, we've had, uh, we had a very strong prime day, and uh, Diwali's off to a good start. Um, and uh, so anyway... The third comment was on uh, other revenue. Um, yeah, that is essentially uh, going to be mostly advertising. And uh, we had a very strong advertising performance in Q3. It's a continuation of the trends that we saw in Q2. Uh, we started to see advertising budgets uh, uh, increase uh, from some of the contraction that had occurred earlier in Q2. Um, and we just had a lot more traffic. And we do a good job of uh, you know, turning that traffic into valuable, you know, um, Real estate for our advertisers and uh, and for our customers to get to, to find out uh, you know more about uh, selection and uh, brand discovery. So uh, most of that is uh, strong quarter. It was strong quarter in advertising, and that's what's uh, what you're seeing in the other revenue line. Our final question will come from Eric Sheridan with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Thanks for uh, taking the question, maybe two if I can. One following up on Mark's question on the advertising side. You know, we continue to see you guys innovate a lot on the product side, especially with programmatic advertising, video advertising. Can you just give us a little bit of a sense of how you see the advertising offering both on Amazon and off Amazon sort of evolving in the years ahead? And the second question would be, coming back, Brian, to your comments in the opening remarks around Prime Video and all the consumption you've seen globally in, in the recent past, how does that help inform what you think about in terms of the opportunity to invest against uh, original content to continue to drive that sort of media consumption loop uh, within the Prime membership? Thanks so much. Yeah, great. Uh, Eric, I'll start off with the uh, questions on advertising. So just to ground you, and I think, you know, our, our main priorities here with this space, and some of these probably aren't too surprising, is, you know, we're focused on making our tools easier to use. So both on the sponsored ads, uh, sponsored brand side. Um, updating, you know, sponsored product targeting, uh, working on just, you know, simplifying registration for agencies and marketers, getting them set up. We're also, you know, very focused on being smarter about surfacing more relevant ads to customers, making display ads easier, um, and then increasing the usability of the Amazon uh, demand side platform. So, um, you know, we've been working on, on a number of those areas and then developing new products. Um, and a lot of that's focused around, you know, how are we serving brands, uh, from various areas, you know, Twitch, um, sponsor brands, the stores, of course, um, so other interesting areas. So, you know, it's, it's, we're certainly in a unique position to be able to provide measurement services that help all these brands sort of understand the impact of, of their advertising in ways that are going to help them uh, grow their business. 
Um, video, you know, you mentioned I think video is one that um, uh, we're, we're working hard on with uh, some of the OTT video advertising opportunities there. I've um, seen some good some good momentum with that. Um, we offer inventory in um, you know, the IMDb, IMDb TV um, ad supported space and on some 3P apps, both on and off the Fire TV. So um, a lot of I think good momentum there and a lot of good learnings on, on some of those initiatives uh, there. Uh, I probably won't you know say too much about what will look like uh, next year in the future, but um, that gives you kind of a sense of, of priorities where we're, we're spending our time and focused on. And on your question on video, so uh, step back. You know, our goal is to deliver high quality and fresh content to our global uh, prime base member base. Um, we're doing that by producing top tier U.S. content that we show globally, and then we augment that with local originals in each region. Um, if we do that job well, you know, we, we've seen it as a very uh, a significant acquisition channel for uh, new prime members, especially in uh, many uh, smaller countries around the world. Uh, we see higher free trial conversion rates, higher membership renewal rates, and then uh, higher overall engagement, as I mentioned um, in Q3 uh, specifically. And when they do that, when they, the more engaged they are, we know that that turns into more uh, uh, Sales on Amazon, and that's a it's a self-reinforcing loop. So we're very happy with the uh, video uh, performance, uh, particularly during this period. I think people have gotten a really um, uh, good chance to test out the con the uh, content. Um, maybe uh, people who hadn't used uh, Prime members who hadn't used that benefit as much in the past uh, have given it another look and have you know uh, really uh, found value in it. Uh, we're in more than 240 countries and territories worldwide. Um, and again, we're seeing some really uh, interesting localized content, uh, you know, developing in places like India, Brazil, Mexico, um, Australia, the UK, and Spain, which I think the uh, customers in those in those uh, countries really appreciate. Great. Thanks for joining us today for the call and for your questions. A replay will be available on our investor relations website for at least three months. We appreciate your interest in Amazon, and we look forward to talking with you again next quarter.